Chapter 38. The Flight to Mr Rogers' Garage. Ida's heart again had sped away with Bonnie, but this time the space it left behind was packed solid with determination. Jin held the back door of the laundry van open and shooed them all in. Not again! Fingers slumped in the snow. It's not going to break down again, is it? asked Brian. It will be much better than a box for the dead. Sophie obediently clambered in first. Too right! Me and Frank thinks it's fun! Frank leapt into Ro- leaped into Robert's arms with a woof and they both practically threw themselves after Sophie. Baby, Ida, are you coming? asked Jin, still catching her breath from the whirlwind of events. Of ev- the whirlwind of events, evidence was all Ida could say. Evidence to finish the job, said Baby, and our Ida knows where it is. At last, Ida felt she was getting somewhere. Where's that, darling? Roger's garage, Queen Street, off West Street, Netterfield. Have to get there before her. She's on her way there now. The words tumbled out of Ida's mouth, one on top of the other. She had no idea if they made sense. Jin opened the passenger door and slid over next to Leonard. Got it. And for goodness sake, jump in, you two. Step on it, Leonard. Leonard revved the laundry van engine. Wait! Harry was running across across the snowy tarmac from his plane. Ida! Do you want to fly? Ida thought she would burst with her worry for Bonnie, her joy at having friends, her gratitude to Harry, her red-hot clawing anger for Mrs Buller, Uncle Arthur and anyone in a black shirt uniform. But on top of all that, with the thrill that she was actually going to fly. Would I? You bet! Leonard, go straight to the town hall! She ran to the little red plane on the runway. Harry ran after her, cradling his injured arm, but veered off into the hangar. Not that one! She's out of fuel, and besides, we couldn't land her. Come on, we're going in the gyrocopter. The what? Ida's excitement turned to an ice-solid snowball in the pit of her belly when she realised what Harry meant. I've had her up a few times. She's perfectly safe. One thing, he lifted his injured arm. Ida, you're going to have to operate the stick. Don't worry, I'll talk you through. She only needs a short takeoff and this one could land on a sixpence if she needed to. There's plenty of space in front of that church on West Street. The gyrocopter looked like only half a plane. Did it even have an engine? Come on! Harry's feet echoed in the huge, otherwise empty hangar. We'll be there in ten minutes. It'll take near near an hour by road and she could have got away with it by then. He climbed into the open cockpit, leaving space for Ida. You can do it, Ida. She was going to operate the stick. Ida Barnes had driven a van and now she was going to fly. She tingled all over over at the thought, but her hands were trembling and she felt her heart heave. Driving was one thing, but flying. Then she thought of Bonnie and realised she didn't have a choice. With Mrs Buller's head start, head start, goodness knows what the horrible woman would have done by, to, with Bonnie by the time they got there by road. And any evidence could well have gone up in smoke. Ida held her hands level in front of her nose. And steady, she could do this. So with Alf's new jacket wrapped round her body, she took a big breath, pressed her lips together and sprinted to the wingless gyrocopter. Ida climbed aboard and squeezed into the seat next to Harry. You'll be fine once she's in the air. He gave Ida a pair of aviator goggles. Wear these. She was fine until Harry started the engine. At least there was one and taxied the gyrocopter out of the hangar. This is the stick, shouted Harry over the noise of the engine. Tilt it backwards and we go up. Forwards and we go down. I'll operate the rudder pedals and the throttle. The chest flutters and the unsteadiness returned. The gyrocopter felt like a rattly old bike, like bits could drop off any moment. Ida clung to the stick and twisted to check the tail was still there. She hardly dared to look above her head at the huge springy propeller. It began to rotate and was soon going round so fast you couldn't see the blades. Then something amazing happened. The gyrocopter lifted off the ground. Back, Ida, just a touch. Ida pulled back gently on the stick and the gyrocopter moved forward and higher. She couldn't believe she was actually doing it. Ida shook with the fright and the thrill of it. Strangely, the higher they went, the calmer she felt. And when they were high enough, she levelled the stick. That's right, Ida, you're a natural, said Harry. And at last, 
there was a minute or two to enjoy the ride. They hovered high over the Hamwell River, a ship sailing down Southampton Water and the white fields and hedges and trees. The world was so small from the sky. Up there with her hand on the stick instead of Harry's injured one, Ida felt she could do anything. Of course she could get Bonnie and get the evidence to put the horrible Mrs Buller away for a very long time. The blades whirred and the motor clackety-clacked. Ida felt a snowflake cold on her nose. She wiped it away and felt more on her hand and the back of her neck. Harry pointed ahead through the fresh white flakes. Amazing! There was the church. They were over Netterfield already. As anxious as Ida was to get to Mr Rogers' garage, up there in the clean white world, a very tiny bit of her didn't want to come down to earth ever again. Minutes later, they had descended quite, quite away and they were almost over a patch of smooth, flat white where underneath was the churchyard green. It was very small. Then Harry did something terrifying. He turned off the engine. Ida was sure they were going to fall out of the sky. But no, the blades continued to turn and when she pushed the stick forward, they descended like a bumblebee hovering over a marigold. The gyrocopter, as good as, fell out of the sky, very slowly, straight down, and landed with the softest bump. Ida had done it. She'd flown a plane, sort of. Her heart was in her throat, but only two thoughts were in her head, Bonnie and evidence. She jumped out of the cockpit. Her legs collapsed beneath her, but she picked herself up, swallowed a lung full of freezing cold air and headed for the churchyard gate with Harry right behind. He hustled her through the gathering crowd of Saturday afternoon shoppers, carrying bags bulging with Christmas presents. Go, Ida, go! I don't trust her, he said. She ignored the gasps and tuts and uh, the well-I-never-dids and ran at top speed down West Street to Mr Rogers' garage while Harry, with no thought for his arm, ran in the opposite direction towards Netterfield Grange. But the garage was shut. The snow was already falling, the foot filling the footprints on the forecourt. Ida banged on the doors and tried the handle, but it was locked. She rubbed a hole in the ice on the window with her fist and peered through. Mr Rogers, are you there? She could see the ruby, the Austin ruby, but no Mr Rogers. She banged on the door again. He had to be there. She wasn't going to have to break in, was she? But she would if she had to. Hold on, hold on. Mr Rogers appeared between the two petrol pumps with a bulging shopping bag in each hand. Had to pop out and get something for the nippers for Christmas. He put one of his bags down and pulled a chain of keys from his trouser pocket. What's all the fuss about, Ida love? In the warmth of the garage, where two little electric fires were glowing red hot, Ida explained. Words stuttered out of her mouth faster than she could think them. Fortunately, Mr Rogers understood and opened the ruby's passenger door. Ida, Ida wriggled her way under the dashboard, unhooked the latch and rummaged in the hidden compartment, which wasn't another way to get to the engine. She felt the waxy cover of the pale pink bank paying in book, the crinkle of more paper, rustly receipts scrawled in ink with the shop's name at the top of each one and pulled it all out. Evidence. Evidence that Mrs Hilda Buller was using the orphanage's money for herself. It didn't prove she was a black shirt. Ida strongly suspected they all knew that anyway. It wasn't a crime. And besides, she reckoned, judging by their march, all kinds of people thought the horrible black shirts were right, just like some people in Germany thought that Mr Hitler and his Nazis were right. But the bundle of papers did prove that Mrs Buller was a thief, and that was definitely a crime. Mr Rogers scratched his head. Well, I never. I have to get this to the council. It's enough to get, a, get her the sack at least. Thank you, Mr Rogers. Ida squeezed his hand with all the warmth she could muster and with the bank book tucked inside her overalls and the bundle rolled up under her arm, she pushed the garage door open. But Ida! Uh, but, but Ida! Mr Rogers' voice faded away as she ran. There were no buts. She ran through the streets, through the snow, lying on the pavements, piling up against the curbs, past the twinkling shop windows and through the hardier Saturday afternoon Christmas shoppers. When she reached the town hall, she realised what Mr Rogers was trying to tell her as she'd left. But Ida, it's Saturday afternoon. The town hall's shut.